Welcome to Variations 4, Neurological Unit. In this video, we'll cover questions 24 through to 27, spinal cord injury. Um, overall, we'll be talking about autonomic dysreflexia and touching a little bit upon falls. 24, explain in one sentence why autonomic dysreflexia may follow once spinal shock has passed. There it is. <clears throat> Reflexes are hyperactive and their response may be exaggerated. So people might start seeing some tremors, some twitching uh, in the limbs. Uh, that could be part of that dysreflexia. This does not represent a return of functioning. It only represents exaggerated spinal reflex responses. So generally speaking, uh, if you, well, what can cause these things? Things like constipation, bladder filling, any kind of noxious stimuli. So for example, the patient might be in bed and have their foot stuck in the side rail. They might be in a wheelchair and their foot gets stuck in the wheel or dragging on the ground. Very commonly, it could be constipation or it could be um, impaction. You see that with, with, with uh, people with GI dysfunction. Uh, impaction could cause, be noxious, uncomfortable stimuli that causes this exaggerated reflex response. Unfortunately, while spinal shock may wear off, the, uh, the tendency for dysreflexia, dysreflexia goes on kind of forever for the rest of their lives. They, they can get this dysreflexia. So, uh, so if the nurse notices the signs and symptoms of this, and it could be um, convulsions or spasms, but especially the cardiovascular responses that we'll talk about below, um, if they notice these signs and symptoms and they know the patient's history, then they need to check for things like, is the patient impacted? Can we figure out if they're constipated? When was their last bowel movement? What was its consistency? Do we do a bladder scan to see if it's full? Should we check and give a catheterization if needed? Should we check their limbs, make sure they're not stuck under the pillow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, looking for the stimuli um, that might have caused this reflex reaction. So what are the signs and symptoms cardiovascularly speaking? Well, that's exactly um, what uh, 25 is asking to, to describe the cardiovascular changes that result from this dysreflexia and they're quite profound. And so in answer to that question, you can just read here. So you get this vasoconstriction and a profound rise in blood pressure to the point that, um, you know, we could be talking about uh, the risk for, well, all the symptoms of hypertension, headache, blurry vision, all that kind of stuff, but the risk of hemorrhage here as well. This is very unsafe and, strain, and a strain on the heart. But uh, paradoxically, the heart rate slows down. So you get this high blood pressure, low heart rate. You got to put that together with the um, history of the patient and then start looking for things that could be causing this autonomic dysreflexia. Hopefully, if you solve the issue, you empty the bladder, you disimpact them, you free the foot from the rail. Hopefully, this causes the um, the cardiovascular changes to kind of reverse back to normal. But um, they might not, and you might not be able to figure out what the noxious stimuli is. And so you might be stuck there with this patient with this profoundly high blood pressure and a relatively low heart rate. What do we do? So you may want to reposition them in the bed, as it says here with the head of the bed. And you may need vasodilator meds to lower that blood pressure. It could be an emergency because you don't want them to stroke out or have a, you know, um, have a bleeding uh, in the cranium. Okay, so 26, your patients had an unwitnessed fall. So 
how this works is that if your patient's had an unwitnessed fall or the fall has been witnessed and someone saw them hit their head, then the approach is going to be the same. And what are our two biggest concerns for someone who's either hit their head when they've fallen or for someone who's had an unwitnessed fall? Our two biggest concerns are obviously bleeding or swelling in the cranium, which would cause an increase in ICP. That's concern number one. Concern number two is that they've done some damage to the cervical spine. How do you assess for each and what is your intervention for each? So if we look at our answers down here, cervical spinal assessment, you can kind of read through that. And there's some overlap between the two. Okay, so you're examining, maybe someone witnessed this or maybe the patient can even talk to you. I've, I've found patients on the floor before and ask them, did you hit your head? No. Did you lose consciousness? No. So what happened in the fall? Oh, I fell down on my knees. Okay, I, I'm not worried about this. I'm not worried about the head. I'm not worried about the neck. They're a reliable patient. They've been able to tell me everything. If they can't remember, then I assume they've hit their head. If some other patient is able to report to me, they fell and hit their head, et cetera, et cetera. And if it's completely unwitnessed, I just assume they've hit their head. The cervical spine needs to be immobilized. And we go through INP how to do that manually. And the first thing you want to do here is call for help because you're going to need help with this, someone to help you immobilize them, someone to get a hard collar, and you, you're going to need help getting them back up onto a stretcher safely while keeping them in the right position. So you will need help. One of the first things you need to do is get help and immobilize the head and neck. Palpation, yes, but just be careful you're not shifting the position of the head and neck too much. And you're checking limbs, of course. You're checking for uh, uh, kind of tingling feelings, loss of sensation, pain, loss of the ability to move. It, it kind of overlaps with your neurological assessment, which is coming down here, which is basically your GCS. And of course, let's get a set of vital signs. It's kind of all right here, examining the pupils as well. And you know from above previous videos what to look for in terms of bleeding in the brain and pupil response. The GCS will also help you detect if the, brain, if the bleeding is fast. So they're gonna need potentially a CT of the head, a CT of the neck, and they might need surgery to fix any damage that's been done. Number 27 just asks us to kind of look at uh, methylprednisolone and the collaborative care for spinal cord injury. So let's just take a look at maps 15 and 16 to uh, kind of round out this video here. So on map 15, if we get the methylprednisolone uh, and IV form to them quick enough within eight hours of injury, it helps to decrease inflammation and edema, which is good because that is less pressure against those spinal nerves and we get adequate blood flow to the spine and this avoids kind of any uh, ischemic damage. Also can help with nerve impulse conduction. Finally, just looking at the head to toe for spinal cord injury. Again, you're gonna find overlap with um, some of this with the head trauma we talked about above, especially if there's a fall involved. So a lot of this should be quite intuitive based on what we've discussed up to now in this unit. And even if we haven't, a lot of it seems to be fairly intuitive. Let's just see if there's anything here we need to touch on. The whole ABGs, the whole respiratory suite here is really, you know, if we talked about that injury above T6 or injury above C4, we we're talking about earlier about the effects on respiratory uh, status. And this stuff's kind of reviewed from above.
Okay, and remembering your total care, repositioning your patient every two hours, really important. No matter where you're going for CPE, this is hugely important. We have lots of patients, even without spinal cord injury, who can't move around enough and are at risk for pressure ulcers, atelectasis, pneumonia. Repositioning is huge, and it just often gets forgotten so much um, by students in acute care because they're so focused on other things. So I just wanted to bring that to mind. And basic care, of course. And the rest is kind of the usual for anyone who's in a bed for a long period of time. 